Thanks for coming. Uh, I may have overdone it a little bit with the Raphael painting, but you know. This is a map of the world with all the interesting places, and guess where I live. Um, so maybe I should, uh, oh yeah, so all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, remember this uh, whenever you model something. So my name is Matthias Fras. I'm an independent consultant. I help teams with uh, enterprise web applications, uh, preferably for complex business domains. Uh, I have sort of a reputation for uh, being good with legacy systems, like the big uh, complex mess that you inherit from developers have, that have long gone. Um, I help teams to, uh, you know, deal with that and actually enjoy that. It's like you have a bigger challenge. Uh, I've been busy uh, the past year. I've been blogging a lot uh, at my website. I started a podcast with Konstantin, the BHAT guy. He's here in the room somewhere. Go talk to him. He's very uh, smart and interesting. And uh, like two weeks ago, uh, because I was getting these emails from people who, yeah, I saw your talk, I read your blog, and can you help me with this domain-driven design problem? And it's uh, like not very efficient to do this uh, by email one at a time. So I just founded the Google group, and uh, in two weeks' time, we have like almost 200 members, and, and I think just as many posts as well. So join it if you're interested in domain-driven design. I haven't even gotten a proper domain name yet, but uh, I will. So what are we going to talk about? The, the domain, when I talk about the domain, I'm talking about the problem space. This is the, the problem that a business is trying to solve. Uh, when we talk about the domain model, it's our uh, interpretation of this problem and our interpretation of this uh, of a solution. It's one potential solution. Um, a domain model is something different altogether than a data model. Often when people talk about the model, they just mean the, the schema that they have in the database and the fields, and, which is a very structural way of thinking about it. It's, uh, it's, more about data. It's, it's, it's more about behavior than about data. The data is almost you know, a, a side effect of the behavior. This is how our users think about uh, software. It's, I do this uh, to get this thing done. Uh, this is the effect that I want. This is the, 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 the behavior I expect. Um, so this is the sort of thing that, that we want to think about. Um, and this presentation, I want to talk about uh, invariants, uh, mostly. So how do you... I, okay, the, tail, the title is uh, also a bit exaggerated, maybe, because there's always ways to break your software. And, uh, you know, people are always going to be more creative in breaking your software than you can come up with ways to uh, prevent it. Um, but you, I I if you remember only one thing, it's to protect your invariants. Think about uh, these business rules and how to make sure that there's no way to do anything with your system that violates uh, these business rules. And I'm not just talking about users. I'm talking about the developers as well. If you have a system where it's very easy for you know, an, another guy in your team to come in and write something that violates these rules, then, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have bugs eventually. So we'll start with, uh, like, the simplest example I could come up with. It's very, very basic. Uh, we talked to our domain expert, and uh, he wants to do some e-commerce thing, maybe. And he says, well, a customer must always have an email address. Um, so this is just for this, uh, if you can't read it in the back, uh, at the bottom there's some disclaimers uh, saying it could be different for your domain. Uh, maybe in your domain customers do not uh, need to have an email address all the time, but for this example they do. And all the examples I'm going to show are going to be very simplified, of course, uh, but hopefully you can, you can imagine how to use this in your own uh, uh, systems. So okay, we, we, we start building and uh, we do this test-driven um, so we, we write a unit test, and you can read this uh, like this. It's a customer should always have an email. That's the name of our test. Uh, I like this different notation for tests uh, for the methods because they're not actually methods. They're, they're descriptions of what our code is supposed to do. And we happen to use classes and methods for our unit tests, but that's just the infrastructure. So it's, this is not a method in the sense that you know, uh, a method in your production code is a, is a method. So okay, we write a test. It's, the test is failing. Um, customer is a new customer. 
assert that customer get email uh, is equal to uh, gym dot example or at example. So how to make this pass, this test pass? Very simple. We uh, set an email uh, onto this customer object, and this test is green. But have we actually proven that it's now uh, impossible for a customer not to have an email address? Well, no, because if you change the order a little bit, then uh, our test fails again. So it's perfectly possible right here to make a customer and it's still in, in an inconsistent state. Um, it's still possible for some other developer to come in and make a new customer object somewhere and he doesn't know about this business rule about always having an email address. So three months later, you discover that half the customers in your database don't have email addresses and it's all messed up and you're losing a lot of money. So what we want to do is make it impossible. And it's, it's very easy. And this is basic object-oriented uh, programming. Uh, and yet, and I'll get to that, uh, people don't do this. So this is uh, by simply making it a required field of the constructor, it's now impossible to make a customer without an email address. Um, and you'd probably want some uh, sound. Is, oh, it's back. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is you should see an object as a consistency boundary. Within an object, all the rules that apply to it should always be uh, met. So it should be impossible to make a customer in this example that does not have an email address. And you know, you're going to say sometimes, uh, uh, yeah, in my domain, uh, we have, uh, like, it's different. Sometimes we have customers that don't have an email, object, an email uh, address yet, uh, and they get one later in the, in the process or in the workflow. If your domain is like that, if, if your, the problem you're trying to solve is uh, more ambiguous than th the rule I, I showed first, where a customer always has an email address, then maybe you are missing some concept. Maybe there's two kinds of customers. For example, you could have a prospective customer, and uh, maybe the moment you actually sell something to them, uh, they become a paying customer. And to have a paying customer, they will need an email address because you need to send them invoices, etc. So um, here we are still, we still have uh, objects as consistency boundaries. Um, the prospective customer is consistent, it doesn't need to have an email address. The paying customer is consistent because it cannot have no email address. So we try to make uh, the implicit explicit. If you discover this sort of vagueness or these uh, multiple rules apply in different contexts, then you're probably missing some, some concept. Try to find it and make it, make it very visible. So and, um, maybe for some bonus points, um, if we add this method here, to paying customer on a prospective customer, uh, then there's only one place that knows how to turn a prospective customer into a paying customer. This rule uh, where you know, this customer becomes a paying customer and needs an email address to have it is now encapsulated in this method, so uh, you, you don't have to know on the outside how this works. And it's still very simple, but if your, your rules become more complicated, then it's very valuable to do this uh, sort of thing. Um, so and what I mentioned earlier is that many people don't uh, do this kind of thing because, they're, uh, because the frameworks often force us uh, to have getters and setters for everything. Um, some ORMs and, and uh, you know, persistence libraries force you to do this. Uh, some form libraries force you to do this kind of stuff with getters and setters. Um, there are ways around that. Uh, well, my, my general answer would be don't use them. Uh, but if you have to use them, you can, you can start to think about layers in between. You could have uh, command objects for your forms. You can have uh, DTOs, data transfer objects. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but you know, read up on that if you have this problem where you feel your framework is forcing you into a, a certain direction. So um, where were we? Yes. Our domain expert comes back to us like, well, he doesn't even say this, but this is what he implied. He didn't think about this because he just assumed 
uh, that the email address was going to be valid anyway. But we know as developers that you know, we can't just have any string uh, being used as an email address. So what many people do, and what, again, these, these uh, typical uh, framework and frameworks and libraries enforce is to have this, all this sort of validation on the outside. Um, and okay, this, this will work, but again, you can, if you forget to validate this stuff uh, on the outside, then it's very easy to uh, end up with a customer object with a, uh, um, that doesn't have a valid email address because somebody forgot to actually do this validation uh, at some other place in the code, especially if your system gets really big and many people work on it and they don't know what the other guy is doing. So, uh, okay, let's, let's write a test. We want our customer to be consistent all the time. Um, so again, customers should always have a valid email this time. And uh, if you've never used PHP unit, you can actually uh, tell PHP unit that you expect that the code is following is going to throw a certain except exception, in this case, an invalid argument exception. So, and we just make a new customer object with an uh, malformed email, and we expect this test to uh, be green when the actual exception is, is being thrown. So again, we can put this logic inside our constructor to make sure it's impossible to make a customer object that uh, has an invalid email address. Um, so this is, this is very simple. But there's one uh, sort of problem that nags me with this. We now have email validation inside of a customer object. This, is, this smells terribly like, like a violation of the single responsibility principle. We don't want a customer to know how uh, emails work. So there's, a, there's, again, we are missing some sort of concept. And it's actually quite simple. We, we just turn email into an object as well. So what is, what is an object anyway? It's, it's uh, an object-oriented programming. It's, it's uh, data and behavior uh, encapsulated together. So if our email, as simple as it may be, is, uh, it has behavior. The, the behavior that it has is being an email address. And being an email address comes with certain rules. So this is uh, like the simplest example of a value object that we can have. Um, and now that we have this email object, we can simply uh, have a customer, uh, have the constructor that type hints for an email. And now it's guaranteed. Well, the, com the customer here, the, this object only knows that it's guaranteed to have an email object. And the email object itself is guaranteed to contain a valid email address. So these responsibilities are now nicely separated into each, uh, each object. And this is very, very powerful. But this is, this is like really, uh, a friend of mine called value objects the heart and soul of object-oriented programming. And, and I, I agree with this. Uh, I feel the same way. So um, if we run our tests now, then we can actually see that uh, you can make a, the, the test still passes, but the responsibility is in a different place, simply because we re refactored this uh, responsibility out to the email object. So uh, it's kind of important to understand this difference. And a customer in, in our model here is an entity, and you're probably familiar with them. You use them all the time, I think. It's an entity is something that has an identity, that has a life cycle, uh, that changes over time. So maybe uh, you, are, you have a first name and you have a last name as a person. Um, even if for some reason your name changes, you are still the same person. If your address changes, you are still the same person. And the way we uh, deal with this, because we cannot compare by value, is we compare by identity. We, we take an, uh, a key, an identity, an, an ID field, and use this to you know, find uh, the representation of this customer or this person in, in our storage and to talk between systems. So if you are you know, customer number five, no matter how much you change, no matter how much your state changes, you are still the same uh, customer. So that's what it means to be an entity. A value object, on the other hand, it's, uh, it has no ID. If I make two value objects, and uh, two email objects, and one is matthias.fraas.net, the other one is matthias.fraas.net, they may be different instances, 
But it doesn't matter. They are equal because their values are equal. And a good way to build uh, value objects is to make them immutable. Maybe you noticed that my uh, email object that I showed before has no setter. Because you don't want to, to change that, uh, it has no life cycle. It doesn't evolve over time. If you need a new email address, you just make a new email value object uh, with a new email inside of it. And it's, uh, you don't mute, uh, mutate an existing one. So, important to remember here, uh, it's again encapsulation, uh, state and behavior that belong together, uh, that express a certain value. Uh, you, want to, you want to encapsulate that in a value object. So, and maybe some other examples uh, for value objects. Um, things like measurements, uh, distances, like one meter would be a value object. Uh, they, they can have more than one value. Uh, one meter has two values. It has the one and it has the meters. It has the, the type of, of, of distance. Um, a date time is a, is a good example. Um, but the one in PHP is actually not a good value object because it's mutable. And I think in PHP 5.5 there's now a uh, date time underscore immutable. So that's, that's a better example. Uh, and you can, you can combine them like a date range is perfect candidate for a value object because it has behavior. It has, uh, uh, like a date range cannot be from today until yesterday. It's always from today till tomorrow, something like that. Uh, so to protect this rule about date ranges uh, cannot be negative, you put this in this date range value object. And it's very easy to reason about your system then because you don't have to protect this, this rule all the time. If you simply say, OK, I type hint uh, for a date range object, then you know it's always going to be valid. Am I still making sense? Oh, I think there's a, a question there in the middle. Can, can you wait for the microphone? Uh, what happens if you want to uh, have validation over multiple um, value objects, like a collection? Where would you put that validation? Do you have an example? So, say if you had um, you have more than one email address, and oh, no, that's a bad example. <laughs> uh, you each have to have a minimum of two email addresses. So, you've, each email is immutable and will ha is a value object which will have uh, its the email address will be validated, but in the person class, uh, the parent class, w would um, would you put the validation in there to say you've got to have a minimum of two? And yeah. if you need it somewhere else on a company and you needed more than two email addresses again? Yeah, well, it, it depends, of course, on the, the problem you're trying to solve. But if, if the rule is simply uh, a customer must have two email addresses, then you can simply uh, check if the array of email address objects that you inject are is at least uh, two items. Um, but if this concept uh, is like more than a simple rule like that, then you probably want uh, to make a new value object that is a composite of other value objects. It could be, well, it's not a really interesting example, but it could be an email collection kind of thing. Uh, just, just the same way that a date range is uh, composed of two date time value objects, so it's, it's uh, a composite. It has rules uh, that, that, uh, are over, that, that are above these two daytime objects. So the daytime object itself has some rules about what is a valid date, but the combination of the two has some different rules. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can come up with some other examples. But I, I, does that answer your question? It, it does, yes. OK, thank you. great. Uh, so other, other examples of value objects are things like uh, money, for example. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, five euros is five plus the currency. You cannot separate these things. You cannot uh, think about money and only think about the, the five without knowing that it's euros. And actually, the euro could be a currency object, again, which also has rules about what is a valid currency. So you can you, you combine these things. and. Uh, a good way to, to actually model your system is to 
model as everything as value objects first, even customers and orders and all these things. And then uh, if you find out that you actually need identities, then you turn these value objects into, into entities. OK, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, let's do some more interesting things. We, we are building an e-commerce system, and this is the core business model. It's a customer orders products and pays for them, um, hopefully, because we wouldn't have much of a business then. So let's take some uh, like traditional getter setter code and uh, try to refactor this. So here, this is uh, all the all the logic is on the outside. In this example, we have an order. We have to set a customer, set products, set status, uh, and then maybe a little bit later, uh, the, the customer pays for the order. So we have to set a paid amount, set a paid currency, set a status to paid. If you actually read this to, to your domain expert, so your domain expert says, yeah, customer orders products and pays for them. And we say, oh, you mean that uh, you know, uh, we have to set customer on uh, order object and set products on? They, they don't understand. This is th what we want is to get closer to the, to the actual domain language and try to make our code almost readable for our, for our domain experts. So let's refactor. Um, Payment status, a great uh, way to, it, it's a value object. It's very simple, it has some uh, possibilities, but the, the validation is inside the payment status object itself. It knows which are valid states and everything else is, is invalid. So now it's already impossible to, to inject uh, a misspelled string in here because it's the payment status value object that is going to protect this. So this is a good uh, first step. Uh, what else can we do? We already, I already mentioned the money uh, value object. Um, instead of saying, uh, uh, you know, set pay demand, set currency, then you can still make mistakes on the outside. Here you cannot. You can only insert uh, val valid, consistent money objects. Um, what else? We can, uh, instead of doing all these setters on this order object on the outside, we agree that an order is always for a customer and a, a bunch of products. Again, this is a simplified example, but you get the point. And instead of doing this status on the outside, we know that a new order is always going to be unpaid from the start, so we just put this inside the constructor. So this rule is now also encapsulated in the, in the order object. And we can do the same thing for paying. Uh, if you pay for an order, then uh, you know, the, the status changes to paid automatically. Um, so we, we want to encapsulate operations. Uh, uh, when, when you need to do stuff to an, an, an entity that you know, changes it or that evolves it through its life cycle, we want to encapsulate the logic that is behind that. Uh, so if you read this now to a uh, uh, domain expert, it's a lot closer to something they understand. We're not quite there yet. We can actually, I have another bonus points slide. Um, if you really want to get closer to the language, you could do something like this. A customer orders products, and a customer pays for an order. This is, I think this is as close as you can get with PHP to expressing something in, uh, in the actual domain language. Um, but careful, uh, with this example, what we've done now is we've coupled um, the customer object to the order object in the other direction as well. Um, because now a customer has to know about, a customer object has to know about how paying works and about how orders work. And even though it delegates, it still delegates this responsibility to the actual order object. So uh, um, in the back of it, we would still have this. But we've, we've you know, added some responsibility to the customer object. So be careful with this. If you have this in like a small contained thing, you can you can uh, do this kind of coding, but if you are going to make a big system and couple everything to everything, you're going to get in trouble. So our domain expert comes back. He says, yeah, we have some new features that we want. Uh, we want to treat our premium customers uh, with some extra care. Uh, premium customers get special offers. And OK, we are maybe a little bit naive in the beginning, and we just had a a Boolean flag saying is premium uh, to the customer and use that as a... But the domain expert said, no, 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 there's, there's 
rules for this. Um, you have to order at least three times to become a premium customer. We don't want to uh, set this status field automatically, uh, or manually ourselves. We want the system to take care of this for us. So, um, okay, we have this business rule. Where do we put this? Um, do we put this inside the customer? Then we create more coupling. Uh, do we put this inside the order? Well, no, because the order doesn't know that there's two more orders. So if we have these business rules that are bridging across multiple entities, then we will have to do it uh, on the outside, but we still want to encapsulate them. So we can make this very explicit. This is uh, the specification pattern, it's called. It's very simple. It has a very easy to understand interface. It's uh, has an is satisfied by method. It takes a customer as an argument and it returns a true or false. So this is a business rule, but it's nicely encapsulated in, in the specification. And it would look like this if you were to implement it for uh, our customer's premium rule. Uh, maybe you would inject an order repository. You can use dependency injection if you saw uh, Stefan's talk uh, before. And you just ask this question, is satisfied by a customer? And on the end side, uh, it knows how to how to uh, uh, find or how to how this rule is defined. And on the outside, you just say customer is premium is satisfied by customer object. And in this case, we will send the special order. If you can see it in the back, probably not. But um, so it just says uh, if customer is premium is satisfied by customer, uh, send a special offer. And, you know, as I'm reading this out loud, you can hear that this is quite close to, to the business again, uh, to the language of the business. Um, and one benefit, of course, is because this business rule is encapsulated, if it changes, then we can simply change this rule in one place. And maybe there's 20 other places that uh, use this rule, but they don't know how it works on the inside. All they know is that it's you know, a specification object with an is satisfied by method. Okay, um, so and uh, another nice thing about this is that we can very easily test it. Um, it's just booleans, so all we need to do is bring our system uh, or our customer objects in a certain state and our orders in a certain state, put this in our uh, repository somehow, and then we can test it. We can just do some assertions, assert false uh, for a customer who only has two orders, and assert true uh, for a customer who has, uh, who has uh, at least Am I still making sense? Is, this, uh, is anybody doing this sort of stuff? Okay, some people, great. Um, so, it gets more interesting because, once again, our uh, domain expert comes back and he says, yeah, this whole thing is working really well, uh, but we've signed up some new clients. Maybe we have, uh, you know, Amazon and, well, probably not Amazon, but we have, we have like 10 new uh, e-shops uh, for dis different uh, uh, companies. And they all have these different rules uh, about what makes a premium customer. So we can actually still we don't, we don't want to touch our original system, uh, and this is the benefit of encapsulation. If, you, if um, IDs and concepts and rules are encapsulated, then you only have to change them in, in one place. And this is, this is basically uh, what dry means. A lot of people think that dry is about code duplication uh, or, or data duplication, but it is in fact about knowledge. It's about single source of truth. There is only a single source of truth uh, in our previous version of what makes a customer premium. Now that we have different rules, there are still single sources of truth um, for each different rule. Um, so here, as you can see, I have uh, I turned the customer's premium, uh, which used to be a class, I turned it into another interface. So our code that used to depend on the customer is premium object still depends on customer's premium. It doesn't know what kind of customer's premium object it's getting, um, but it, it, it doesn't care. As long as it's an object with an is satisfied by method, uh, then it knows that it it's, uh, can answer this question uh, 
for them. Um, so I have some examples. Maybe for one client, we have a customer with three orders is premium. For another, a customer with uh, 500 euro to total is, uh, is premium. Maybe we have a third one, a customer who bought luxury products is premium. And the implementations of all these uh, specifications is going to be completely different. One is maybe going to use the order repository, and another one is maybe going to use uh, some external service and talk to some, maybe to some database uh, from a third-party <coughs> system or some uh, API where it can ask these questions. And um, so it doesn't matter what technology or system or or source of truth is behind it uh, to our existing code. It's still the same thing. It's just customer is premium. So and this is uh, what it could look like in our client code if we have a, like a special offer sender or something. Um, it knows to send offers to uh, a customer if the customer's premium specification is satisfied by this customer. Um, still making sense, I hope. Yes, great. I like you guys. Um, I have a bit of an example of how you would do this with uh, dependency injection in uh, Symfony. The same ID applies to any other uh, dependency injection library that you use. Uh, basically, you configure um, for different... Uh, so I used Amazon as an example here and eBay, but I doubt they would use our simple system at this point. Um, but So the, the ID is the same, and uh, we load depending on you know, the customer or the tenant string that is somewhere in, in our system, we will uh, create a different object, but we give it the same uh, key in our uh, DI. So again, on the outside, um, elsewhere in the system, we would have maybe the special offer sender, and it knows that it, wants, uh, it needs a service called customer's premium, but it doesn't know which of these two it's getting. So we don't have to check configuration everywhere in our system and uh, like uh, if uh, tenant equals Amazon then we apply this rule and if tenant equals eBay we apply that rule. It's all uh, in one place, it's isolated, we can easily reconfigure it, we can even make it more dynamic if we need to for some reason. So what I want you to remember is to use uh, the specifications as a way to encapsulate business rules about uh, object selection. It's not the only way, of course. It's, there's, there's many ways to skin a cat. But for me, this has been working quite well. I've actually used this for uh, things like uh, deciding on, on you know, permissions. Uh, can this user access this uh, particular thing, for example? It's nice to put it in a, in a separate object. But of course, our domain expert comes back and he says, well, this is nice, we're making money off this new feature, but uh, we, we're, we're kind of losing track. We are growing and we don't know how many premium customers we actually have and how many you know, uh, special offers we are sending them. So can you just make me a list of all the premium customers? And um, well, before we do this, we need to get into what is a repository. We haven't really covered that. Um, there's two ways of looking at a repository. Um, most uh, libraries I've seen uh, have a repository as something that is uh, uh, persistence oriented. So what is a repository? It's something that takes care of putting an object in a database for you and getting objects out of that database for you. Um, this is fine as a way of looking at this, um, but it's a very, uh, it's, it's kind of a limited way of, of looking at this problem. It's, again, it's structural thinking, it's data-centric thinking, it's uh, persistence-centric thinking. The um, approach that I like more is uh, collection-oriented repositories. So if you look at this interface, at these, these methods that the, the customer repository defines, add, remove, uh, find, find all, find, registered in year, uh, these kinds of things, these are methods that work just as well on a collection. If this was an in-memory collection, the interface would look exactly the same. You would never write an in-memory collection object and have methods like uh, persist on there, or, or safe, or uh, stuff like that. So this um, 
this interface doesn't betray that in the background it's maybe saving these customer objects to a database. And uh, the nice thing of having an interface like this is that you can replace this interface or, or implement this interface with uh, an in-memory collection, uh, which is very nice for unit tests because then you don't have to talk to your database. You can implement it with a, you know, maybe a doctrine customer repository or a, or a PTO customer repository or maybe a Mongo customer repository, things like that. So, uh, but your client code is still going to think it's just a customer repository with some collection uh, style uh, methods. Um, so we create the illusion of an in-memory collection, even though in, in the background it's actually persisting to uh, database. Um, so this is what I just said. Okay, so we have our, uh, if you remember, we need to make this, uh, this list of premium customers. We have a customer repository. We already have this uh, specification. So it's actually uh, quite easy. We just tell our customer, or, or add a new method to our customer repository saying, uh, find satisfying uh, using this customer specification. So um, if you implement this, and this is a very naive implementation, then we say the, maybe the database customer repository finds satisfying the customer specification. It will loop over all the customers and check for each of them if uh, the specification, the business <coughs> rule, is satisfied uh, by this particular customer object. Uh, you could do this with, if you're not familiar with the array uh, filter uh, function, you could just as well do this with the for each and just put all the customers that where the specification returns true, put them in a new array and, and return that. Uh, so it's the same thing. Um, so this, is, this works really nice. We now uh, have enforced our business rule using our specification. Um, so we still have this knowledge in one place, this understanding of how this business rule works. But of course, it's, uh, if you have a lot of customers in your database, this is not going to be very efficient. Uh, what we actually want is to do a you know, proper database query. So one way to look at this is that you know, uh, 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 the, query could, the query could be quite simple. If, if the rule is just uh, having three orders, then you would have something like select uh, from customers where uh, and you, or you join with the orders table and you do a count and you check if the count is uh, three or more. Um, but where to put this? Um, so one way of looking at this is that this query that we just wrote is a different representation of the same business rule that we wrote in code before. So a good way of doing that is uh, to just put this together. Um, there is a downside, of course, because now we have SQL in this specification object. But uh, the upside is that uh, our two representations of this same business rule are now uh, you know, co-located in one, in one class. So if one of them changes, we can go back and, uh, and change the other one as well. So how, do, how to read this? It's, uh, it's this customer with three orders as premium <laughs> object. Uh, you can now like, cast it to a query. Um, and the way it works on, in the repository is that this find satisfying method that we did earlier with the naive array filter, uh, it now queries using the query, the SQL representation of this uh, specification object, of this business rule. And it could be SQL, it could be DQL if you use uh, Doctrine, um, could be something else. Uh, this is called double dispatch because on the outside we, uh, we uh, tell the repository, give us all the customers satisfying this specification, and on the inside, the repository says, okay, specification, give me your representation in SQL, and I will use that to query uh, the database. Still making sense? Yes, awesome. Um, so there, if, if you want to get rid of this, uh, having this query and this, uh, uh, this code version of the same uh, business rule in, in, in this uh, specification object, there's way or ways around that, but um, I don't think they're very interesting or very useful because for me, 
something like this is working quite well. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, uh, it's nice, it's encapsulated, it's easy to understand. Please. Oh, wait, uh, we need the microphone because the talk is being recorded. So in the example there, how you, is it uh, that you have extended the customer specific specification interface then to include the SQL function? Um, well, it, de it depends. If you know you're always going to have it, then you can put it in the customer specification uh, interface. But I wouldn't put it on in the like a more generic specification interface because not all of your specifications are going to need an uh, SQL representation. But you, you figure this, these things out where you need them and where you don't and what works. And if you put it in the interface and it turns out that you didn't need it, then you can still. Or you could have like an, an additional interface, maybe a, a queryable, well, that's a bad name, but a specification that you know, is allowed yeah, to I be a, a query. OK, so um, something very interesting now. Uh, who of you guys and girls uh, tests their SQL queries. One, two, three, four. Oh, this is uh, more people than I ever had <laughs> in, a, in a single room. You're, you're a smart audience. It's now very easy. Why? We, what, what is a test? A test is doing something a different way, comparing that to your production code, comparing the result. And if this result is the same, then you know that you know, uh, the production code is correct. And now we have two representations. We have our query, and we still have our encode representation. We haven't thrown that away because we still need that if we only want uh, to check one single customer. So it's now very easy to actually write tests for our queries. Uh, you, you make a copy of your uh, production data, and let me repeat that, a copy of your production data, and you can just run your tests against that. So you, you keep the same, uh, the way we did it in the beginning with the naive array filter, we can still do that. We fetch all our customers from our production data, or if it's too big, you make a smaller version for your tests. Um, so you fetch all these customers, you apply the specification to them, you filter them out, and you compare the result with the result of your query. So this is a, like a, quite a cheap way, actually, to, to test your queries against your production data to make sure that uh, you haven't missed anything. Because if your rules become more complex, then writing these queries can, you know, they can, the queries can, be, can become very hard to understand. But now you can easily validate them. Um, and actually, well, this, this example here that I have is not very complete. Uh, what you actually would want as well is to make sure that, uh, well, actually, no, it would work. So anyway, you want to make sure that all the customers that pass the specification uh, are in the list of customers that you queried, and all the ones that didn't pass the specification are in the, uh, in the ones that you didn't query. But um, I think this, this is uh, kind of self-evident. So what you can remember here is to um, test uh, your, your business rules and your uh, queries by comparing different representations of the same uh, business rule. So these are some ideas to uh, help you ensure that these rules are always uh, nicely protected, that these variants are always there. So this, these are the things that I, uh, I want you to remember. It's to protect your invariants at all time. Always think about what, what uh, rules are here. Even uh, the rules that your domain expert didn't make explicit, try to find them. There's always hidden rules everywhere of things that are, uh, that are just not allowed, that are inconsistent, that will make your database corrupt, that will you know, introduce subtle bugs that you will have to figure out sometime at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so the, this, is, this is the core thing. Uh, this is, this is object-oriented design at its heart, I think. It's finding ways to, to uh, build code where you cannot really go wrong. And you can still fool around. And I mean, if somebody really wanted to make that customer object that we had in the beginning without an email address, then they could use reflection or some other black magic to do it. But if somebody uses reflection to make a customer object without an email field, 
then you would notice if you, especially if you review the PR of the pull request of this guy, uh, you will see, hey, what is going on here? What are you trying to to do? And then maybe you will discover there's some some missing concept. You know, the example from the the prospective customer and the paying customer. Um, the other thing, objects as consistency boundaries. This is objects are not just you know stupid temporary placeholders for state. They are especially in your in your domain model. They are the core thing. They are how how do you look at this this world? How do you look at this problem space? How do you model this? Uh, well, model it as things that are always correct, always consistent. And um, the way to do this is to encapsulate state and behavior. Use things like value objects. Use them a lot. They are, they are awesome. They, they make your life better. Uh, they are easy to test because they are so simple. And they are easy to compose the things that I, I told you about, with uh, like the, the date range or uh, time slot or things like. Uh, I have a, a client. Um, it's a system for uh, education. We have a value object called school year. It, it's Basically, it's like, uh, what's a school year? It's, it starts at September 1st, it ends at August uh, 31st. So these are, there are some, there's some behavior to a school year that is different than behavior to a calendar year. If I ask this school year object, uh, what are your weeks? Then I get weeks from, uh, the week from September 1st to this uh, calculation of which are the weeks that go into this particular school year is now encapsulated in the school year object. And there's a lot, lots of these things that become very easy if you, if you come up with, if you model each of these little concepts as, as uh, separate objects. So this is uh, the gist of it. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, lots of them. <laughs> well, we still have uh, like 15 minutes, I think. Uh, you mentioned that your domain expert would have different criteria that makes someone a premium. Uh, and then in your uh, find premium, it seemed to only be looking for the three orders total. So how would you make it find all the different sort of criteria of premium? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, so you had um, three orders total, made a customer premium, and then for other customers, having 500 euros, I think, made them premium. Uh, then in your as SQL, that was only there for the three orders total criteria. Yeah, well, each, each of these uh, rules are a different specification object, so they would have a different, they would have their own S SQL method, so each of them is a different way of... Uh, d d does that answer it? Or? Um, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, if I'm saying to the customer repository, I want all of my premium customers, I'd expect it to find Oh, okay, if you want that, yeah. So my assumption here was that you have, like, uh, it's a SaaS where everything is for one tenant only. So if you are in the, if you are in the Amazon version, then, you, then there will be only this one business rule. If you log into the eBay version, there's only this one business rule. There's no, in, in my you know, simple example, there's no way to actually find the premium customers for all different tenants at the same time. If you'd want that, you'd have like maybe an, a layer on the outside or, or some uh, administration kind of interface where uh, I can check for all of my uh, tenants, uh, which is which. But usually, you would probably just log into one of these tenants' uh, admin interfaces, something like that. OK. Somebody else? I think over there. Uh, if we go back to the value object on an email, if you expand that and says that a customer has to have a valid address and also a valid phone number, meaning that you have three value objects, uh, if you want to return an error message to the customer if either of those are wrong, or a list of error messages if there's multiple wrong, how would you do, would you validate before you create the value object or would you do it inside the value object? Yeah, so um, the things I've been talking about are about having a model that is valid and consistent. Uh, the problem you're describing, uh, showing an error message to a user, actually has nothing to do with your model. It's a completely different concern. It's, it's about um, user experience. You want to present the user with a form um, that helps him to fill in uh, valid values. 
Um, there's different ways of doing that. You could have like uh, client-side validation, which is probably the best for user experience. Uh, if you use a, a backend form library like the, the one in Symfony, then this is going to re-render your form with, with messages. You, you can still have validation there, but it's a different kind of validation. It may be, often it looks very much the same because the same rules are going to apply, but I, I see this as two completely separated concerns. And this is why, uh, for, for many people, it's, this stuff is difficult, because they try to do this in, in one place, um, which means it's, it makes it kind of impossible to, to do it cleanly. You have to, these form libraries, they, they sort of slash through your whole MVC. They know about your model, they know about your, your uh, controllers, they know about your templates and your forms. This is too much responsibility. Keep it simple and just, uh, if you want to validate a form, do form validation. If you want to validate your model, do model validation. If this means that you do them both, that's fine, because sometimes you will have this model without forms. If you have a, an API on top of your model, then this API will not use this form validation. Um, and sometimes uh, I, I, it can happen that your... So make sure that your model validation is complete and consistent. If your form validation is not complete, then your model will still catch uh, the, the things that slip through the maze, but it will never allow uh, um, inconsistent data to enter your, your system. Uh, if this happens, you, can s you throw exceptions. You throw exceptions in your value object if something is off. You throw it in, in, uh, in the entities if something is, is, is off. And you can, you can use these uh, exception messages and show them back to the user. The experience for the user will be uh, less nice because they get more technical messages. But if you're, that will force you to make better uh, form validation or better client-side validation to make it, so, so to prevent users from ever getting to the point where they get an exception from the model. Um, and actually, you can even be more strict about it and say, if you really trust your form validation uh, or your client-side validation uh, to be complete and catch every, every violation, um, then you can say that if the model throws an exception, you just do like a, a 500 status code and just say, no, can't do this. Because if you trust it, then you know that every request that you get that is uh, uh, not consistent is somebody trying to hack your system, somebody trying to work around the client side and the, and the server side validation, form validation, uh, to get invalidated on your system. So, and if somebody tries to hack my system, I don't worry about showing nice messages and, and you know, coloring the form and whatever. Uh, because they don't care either. It, we, we just block it. It's, it's invalid. You're trying to hack my system. I'm not going to help you by giving you more information. But the important thing is, for me, these are totally different concerns. If you look at them this way, single responsibility, form validation, user experience, one side of the world, uh, a coherent model, other side of the world. And any client, like if you have maybe a command line interface, REST API, I don't know, whatever you come up with, mobile application, they, they uh, will all use this same model, and this model is going to be guaranteed uh, consistent all the time. Does that answer it? Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. great. Thank you. Hi, while I'm a, a fan of object orientation, um, my concern with your approach to value objects and to um, require, you require an email, address. If you have a large representation of your model and you require large numbers of attributes and you're enforcing that through the constructor, how is that then, it, it, it doesn't strike me as very pragmatic to have a huge constructor with all of those you, dependencies. You mean in terms of there. performance? I... Uh, not just performance, but readability and using the code itself. Um, uh, you know, it's fine for the examples that you have given, but when you've got large numbers of requirements for a single model, how would you overcome that with this? Is, that the, is this the right approach? Whereas if you're enforcing validation from the outside on a plain old PHP object as some frameworks are using, surely that's a bit more pragmatic. 
But I, I don't, if you're not talking about performance, then I don't really understand what is more pragmatic about doing it on the outside. Uh, if I have to create a customer object and every time I do that, when I call new, I have to specify the first name, last name, uh, and all of that up front in my code, uh, I'm going to have lines either split on multiple lines just so I can fit it within my width, or it's just going to run off the end of the page. So, uh, but that's how, how is cognitive yeah. overload in doing that? So how is a uh, new customer and then having five arguments uh, less pragmatic than new customer, set address, set name, set email? I don't, uh, I don't really see how this is less pragmatic in some way. Well, no, because if you're injecting it with another framework from, uh, well, sorry, with another system from the outside, then you can manage that separately. But in doing so, you have to uh, enforce the requirements separately. Does that make sense? Uh, so if, you, if, you're, if you're hydrating yeah. uh, from the outside with getters and setters, uh, you'd have to apply the validation separately, but you can just construct your user constructor on the fly. Yeah, but if, I, I mean, if you're talking about hydration, then you're probably talking about uh, getting stuff out of your database or deserializing it from some other uh, um, service that, or some API or something. Um, it largely depends, uh, but um, you know, use use a persistence library that allows you to to do this kind of stuff, like Doctrine. I think it's still the best one we've got for these kinds of problems. Um, if you use, if you need to deserialize stuff, uh, you know, I I don't like the the really slow and huge uh, uh, serialized like the JMS one. They they are well, they're they're slow and they they sort of get inside your objects too much. So I I tend to write my own deserializers for this kind of stuff. Um, the, on, the only problem that I can see is if you really need to like import a gazillion customers and you have uh, maybe a, a, an, uh, some, some um, regular expression on each of the email addresses and you make an object for like millions of, of objects, then it's going to be slow and then maybe you want to skip this sort of thing if you are confident that this data is, uh, is correct. Uh, but that's the only, like the only case I can think of uh, for not doing this this stuff. It makes your system a lot more easier to think about because uh, it's going to be uh, valid all the time. And just you, so I, I'm not arguing to put everything in the constructor, only the things that are essential to have a valid customer. If your system allows customers without a street address, then don't put it in the constructor. It doesn't belong there. It's an optional thing. Um, so, does that help? Uh, I'll agree to disagree. Okay. <laughs> we can talk later. <laughs> I think there's uh, somebody in the back there, yeah. I felt like uh, the last question was about a large number of the parameters in the constructor, and um, so I would suggest to investigate a builder pattern, so that would allow us to build the objects by providing them with uh, clever default, which would inside pass it all in the constructor, but letting them set before building the object itself. Yeah, uh, couldn't agree more. But often, uh, so if you have a lot of parameters in the constructor, then maybe again you are missing a concept. Maybe you are trying to do all these parameters individually. Maybe instead of having a street and a city and whatever, you just want an address value object, stuff like this. Um, um, somebody else? Yeah. Uh, on the, uh, the validation thing that you were talking about before, I kind of get your point that there are the different concerns and that you have data consistency. Does that not, though, lead you to a kind of system inconsist inconsistency potential where you've got uh, different validation rules on one piece of data because time and different people and stuff, you know? So you've got one JavaScript validation on your form and then one on your model that you want to be the same. So you've got, you're kind of trading consistency. Yeah, well, I, I prefer my, my state to be consistent. So I want my model to be consistent. This is the heart of it. This is why, you know, domain-driven design is model-centric. Um, if there are inconsistencies between my uh, client's validation or, or my form validation and my model, um, many things can happen. Maybe this is not really a big problem for the business and 
maybe it never gets fixed and maybe one in a million users has some form that they cannot submit. And if it doesn't hurt the business, then nobody will complain. If it does hurt the business, then you, you know, somebody is going to have to fix this bug and just make sure that you know that these things happen. Uh, if you worry about it, then make sure you have some monitoring on how often do uh, form uh, submissions fail, for what reason do they fail, look at this, uh, uh, this log and, and figure this out and fix it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'd rather have inconsistency between these two validations than have uh, inconsistency inside my model. This is the central thing. Everything else just needs to adapt to my model. Or my model is wrong and then I need to change it. But I think we have time for one more, maybe? OK. Uh, my question is about more about architecture. Um, in the beginning, uh, starting something, you have the entity class in one side, defining the properties, getters and setters. Then you go to the persisting your data, you have the repository class. This is the, the, the very, very early stage of any, any, any kind of the tasks of inside your, your model. My question is, when you start to make the model complex, I mean, adding the, bus the business rules, is your opinion there must be inside the entity or they should go with the repository or in, in the other end on a third different layer of yeah, well, object model? It depends where the rule applies and this is the the difficulty in modeling, of course, is figuring out uh, what kind of things will I group together and where will I put these rules. And, uh, but I'd like to, uh, more interesting, but maybe a topic for a different uh, presentation would be uh, to not start your model from your entities and these kind of things, because that's still kind of structural thinking. If you start your model from, for example, uh, commands, command objects, and you, you just start listing on a whiteboard or on post-its, things like, um, you know, pay for order, that's a command. You, you just name it in the imperative uh, um, sense. Um, pay for order, uh, add product to basket. You start with these commands. This is your interface to your user, and you build everything from there. You just start looking at, okay, if I have these commands, where do I put this state and behavior to enforce these, these rules? Sorry. But that's something to discuss, uh, yeah, I think. Making the question again, <laughs> sorry. Uh, starting on that way, should I start with the comments on the entity type class, or should be any other kind? Uh, I, or try, it doesn't matter at all. Well, it doesn't matter where you start, as long as you get there, of course. But I, 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 in, in this case, at least I try to start from value objects and, and see which ones actually need to be or want to be entities, and try to keep, keep the logic contained to where it's you know, the most relevant place. But this is the vaguest answer I can I can give. So. Thank you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>